Hello, and welcome to this session about Query Store in depth. My name is Ola Hallengren. I work in Saxe Bank, an investment bank in Copenhagen in Denmark. Okay, let's look at the agenda for this session. We're going to start by getting an overview of Query Store. And then we're going to look at what is new in SQL Server 2022 when it comes to Query Store. There are quite a lot of new features. Then we're going to look at how we can use Query Store when troubleshooting different performance problems and how Query Store is working in different scenarios. We're also going to look at how we can use Query Store data and analyze that using tools like Power BI and Power Pivot. And there will be a lot of demos in the session. Now let's dive into Query Store. So Query Store is the flight data recorder in SQL Server. It captures queries, query plans, runtime statistics, and weight statistics. It was introduced in SQL Server 2016. It's very easy to enable it, just an alter database set query store on command. And actually it is on by default starting in SQL Server 2022 and also in Azure SQL database and Azure SQL managed instance. All the data in query store is stored in the user database. Now let's look at the improvement in Query Store since it was introduced in SQL Server 2016. So in 2017, Microsoft added weight statistics to Query Store. And that's really nice because it means that for each query and query plan, you can see what were the weights for a certain uh, interval. In SQL Server 2019, Microsoft made some changes to the capture policy. They changed the default capture policy from being all to auto. And they also introduced a new custom capture policy. And I will go a little bit uh, deeper into this in a later slide. Another thing is that they changed the behavior for uh, when Query Store is starting up. Before it was like this that uh, database did not come online until Query Store was ready. And this could be a problem if you had uh, a large query store. And for that, Microsoft introduced a trace flag, 7752, uh, that meant that query store was loading asynchronously, meaning that database was coming online, even if query store was not ready. And this behavior, they are now made a default. And that's a good change. Now let's look at SQL Server 2022. So one big change is that Query Store is now on by default for all new databases that you're creating. Not for existing databases, if you're restoring uh, or doing an in-place upgrade, but for all new databases that you're creating. Another new improvement is that you can now enable Query Store on secondary replicas. Before, even if you had uh, readable uh, secondary replicas, you cannot capture queries uh, that was happening on those uh, replicas. But uh, that is now possible in SQL Server 2022. And I have another slide on that and uh, demo here a bit later. Another big improvement is that you can now also uh, use Query Store to apply hints. Uh, before you can do that uh, using plan guides, but now you can do it much more easy using Query Store. They have also made some improvement to plan forcing. Uh, it has some internal improvements so that uh, plan forcing is more efficient. And one more thing here, and that is for the first time, uh, 
cryostore is used, you can say, internally by some new optimizer feature, intelligent query processing feature. So these three features that I've listed here, uh, they will only work if you have query store enabled. And now of course it's enabled by default, but that's another argument for having query store enabled. Now let's look at what information is stored in query store. So we have the queries, the query text and the query plans. And this information is stored at the first execution. Actually the first execution uh, that meets the query store capture policy. And then we have the runtime statistics and the weight statistics. The runtime statistics, this is like the number of executions, the duration, the CPU, logical reads, physical reads, and so on. Weight statistics, that is the, you can say, similar to, uh, to the weight types, just groups together in weight categories. And all of this information, the runtime statistics and the weight statistics is stored by interval. And by default, the intervals is one hour. That means that for each query and query plan and interval, you can see the runtime statistics and the weight statistics. One important thing is also that both the runtime statistics and the weight statistics um, is broken down by execution type. So we can distinguish between regular, meaning successful executions, aborted, meaning there was a timeout, and exceptions, meaning there was some kind of error. In SQL Server 2022, we also have the query hints. And they are, of course, also stored in Query Store. So if you create a query hint, it will be stored in, uh, in a special uh, Query Store query hint view. And then we have the other new thing, and that's the query plan feedback. So that is used internally by the optimizer intelligent query processing features. So for example, the memory grant feedback, before that was just in memory. Now in SQL Server 2022, that's being stored in, um, in Query Store. Now let's look at what information is not in Query Store. So Query Store does not have any information about who executed the query. There is no login name, no host name, and no application name. If you need this information, then you will need to do uh, traces or extended events, or look at DMVs. Another thing is that the query plans in Query Store, they do not have any runtime information, meaning that the information like you see in uh, the actual execution plans, like for example, actual number of rows or actual number of batches, that is not available in the plans in Query Store. And the reason for that is that a plan is only stored in Query Store the first time. And of course, the actual number of rows and actual number of batches they are different for each executions. So that's why that cannot be included. Another thing is that Query Store does not have any information about individual query executions. It only has aggregated information um, for the intervals that I mentioned before. So for each by default one hour interval, it has information about number of executions, CPUs, and so on. 
but does not have any information about individual query executions. If you need that, you would have to use extended event or trace. Now we're going to look at query store for secondary replicas. That's a new feature in SQL Server 2022. So let's start by a demo here. So here I have two servers uh, with SQL Server 2022. And you can see here that I have an availability group called uh, Wide World Importers. And that contains one database. Wide rolling portals. Now let's um, enable query store. So you see, I enable query store here, and that's actually not needed because it's uh, enabled by default. But I need to enable it for secondary replicas. And you see, you do that on the primary. So this is the syntax for secondary set query store on. So let me run that. So now I only have one secondary here, but it will be enabled on all secondary replicas. Now let's do a test here. So I'm gonna execute the store procedure on the primary. So let me do that. So I execute this store procedure here 50 times. And now, and this was on the primary. Let me see, this is on the primary. Okay. Now I execute the same store procedure again, but now I switch to the secondary replica. That's number eight. And here I executed 100 times. Okay, now that's completed. So now let's have a look at Query Store and see how it looks like. So I have the script here where I just joined together runtime, runtime statistics with the Query Store plans, Query Store query, and then a filter on this store procedure. So let's make sure that I'm connected to the primary. and then um, see what it looks like. Okay, so now we can see here that, uh, we have those 50 executions and these are executions that I did on the primary. We don't see the secondary, the executions that I did on the secondary yet. There is a delay for that, and I will go through that in a moment. One interesting thing also is that there is a new column here in runtime statistics. So if we look all the way to the right, there's a new column here called replica group ID. And it's not documented yet, but it looks like one means the primary replica, two means the secondary replica, and we cannot see it yet here. So now let's go through a little bit how it's working. So how it's working is that all the query store data from the secondary replicas, for queries on the secondary replicas, that's sent back to the primary replica and being persisted on the primary replica. And then because it persisted in the, on the primary replica, uh, as a part of the availability group synchronization, it will be replicated out to the secondary replicas again. And 
there is a bit of delay for this first day appears to, to, uh, to happen. I'm not sure exactly how long time it can take, but um, in this uh, CTP 2.1, seems like it can take 5-10 minutes or something. Here's the column that I was managing, replicate group ID in uh, query store runtime stats. Now let's look at the primary replica again. So I execute the script here. And now let's have a look. Now we can see that we have the 50 executions and the 100 executions. So let's also look at uh, replica group ID. Now we can see that the fifth executions, those are the ones I executed on the primary replica. We replicate group ID one. And the 100 execution, those are the ones that are executed on the secondary replica. We replicate group ID two. Now let's look at another new feature in SQL Server 2022, and that is query store hints. So this feature is useful when you want to add a hint and you're not able to modify the query in the application. That could be, for example, that you have a vendor application where you want to add a hint, but you don't have access to the code. So it supports the hints that are available in the option clause. And here is how it works. So, the query is again getting executed through the application. And as you have query store enabled, it will be captured with a query ID. And then the next step is that the DBA can go in and add a hint for that specific query ID. And then the next time the query is executed, it will be executed with that specific hint. So let's try it out. I prepared a demo here. So first, I'm just going to clear the Procedo cache and the query store. And then I go in and execute the query. So let's see here, select star from sales orders for customer ID equals to customer ID. And here we're passing the, the actual customer ID. Okay, when this one has completed, we're going to have a look in Query Store. So I have a script here that is joining together the runtime statistics with, um, with the plans, the queries, and the query text. So now this one completed. Okay, now we can see the query here. So you see it's the same query as we executed. Select star from sales orders where custom ID equals to custom ID. And here we have a query ID, query two. Okay, so now let's say that I want to add a hint to this specific query ID. How do I do that? So I might start to add a new store procedure, SP query store set hints, where you pass the query ID to. And then you can pass a hint. So in this case, I specify max stop equals to two. But that could be an anything. It could be a recompile, legacy canality estimator, um, index hint, for seek, any other hint that you can specify in the option clause. So now I've added a hint. And we can try executing the query again. And there's also um, a view to have a look at the hints that you have added. So you see here, query store query hints. 
So here we see query two, and here's the hint, option max top two. And you can also see if they have, if there's been any, uh, any failure for the, for the hints. So this is, works the same way as for plan forcing. And let's see, this one executed and we don't see any failures. So that means that it works. So you see, it's really, really easy to use and very useful in cases where it's not possible for you to, um, to change the, or modify the, the application or query in the application. So then you might be thinking, hmm, didn't we have this feature already? There's something called plan guides that maybe some of you have been testing. And that is correct. There is a feature called plan guides that's been around since SQL Server 2008. So let's try to do a comparison here. How is the query store hints uh, better than the plan guides? So I made a comparison here. So one thing is that, as you saw, the query store hints is really easy to use. Plan guides, on the other hand, for those of you that's been trying it, it's quite difficult and very error prone. If you don't get everything 100% right, it will not, it will, it's not working and it's difficult to troubleshoot it. You need to specify the exact query text and so on. Some other differences is that, okay, let's say that you have added a hint and for some reason the hint cannot be applied anymore. Maybe you added an index hint and the index doesn't exist or anything. So with the query store hints, uh, the query hint that is not working, it will just be ignored. And the query will succeed as normal. Uh, and you can even see, as we looked at before, you can see there are columns in, uh, in the catalog view, query store, query hint, where you can see the reason for the failure. The plan guide, on the other hand, is really bad. In the same case where the hint is not working, the query would just fail. So let's say that you had added a, a hint with a, an index hint and you have dropped the index, then the query will stop, will stop failing. So in this respect, the query store, behave, query store hint behavior is much better. Another thing is that let's say that you have a store procedure and let's say that you have added um, now, a hint, query store hint for one of the queries in the store procedures. Uh, and now what if you want to change the store procedures? Well, with query store hints, you can just go in and do that. No problems. Of course, if you have made, uh, you know, uh, if you have added a hint for, you know, one query and that has changed, then, you know, this query, the old query will not be executed anymore and there will be no hint for the new query, but nothing will fail. With a plan guide, on the other hand, if you created a plan guide uh, for a store procedure, then you will not be able to change that store procedure or drop that store procedure. So that could, for example, cause an, uh, you know, deployment of an application to fail. So I think that query store hints is a really nice feature and a big improvement compared to the old plan guides. So I was talking before about some changing, changes to the query store capture policies. So in SQL Server 2016, 2017, the default capture policy was all. And that means that all queries are captured in a query store. There's also another capture policy called Auto. That's also been available all since 2016, but it was not the default until 2019. So the difference is that Auto will not capture all queries. It will only capture queries that is considered, you can say, significant from resource consumption point of view. Uh, the thresholds are not documented, uh, but the idea is that let's say that 
you just have a tiny query that's being executed one time in Management Studio, maybe you don't need to capture that one. One important thing is that regardless of thresholds, store procedures will always be captured. And uh, yeah, so this is the default in 2019 and forward. And it's a good option also in earlier versions. So sometimes you might want to have more control of it. And for that reason, Microsoft introduced a custom cache policy in 2019. So if you use this one, then instead of just the auto, when Microsoft decides the thresholds, then you can decide the threshold based on execution count, the compilation CPU, and the execution CPU. So here are the defaults of the enable this capture policy, the custom capture policy. And it's enough that one of those thresholds are met. So if there would be total executions, okay, then it will be captured. Or if the CPU is, 1000 millisecond or the compilation CPU is 1000 millisecond or the execution CPU is 100 milliseconds. So just one of these is enough. And you can go in and change those, uh, those thresholds as you like. Again, store procedures will always be captured. And overall, uh, the default auto is uh, micro third uh, configuration, and that's what I, I used to recommend. Now we're going to look at some different ways of using Query Store. So, one way is that you have some high resource utilization on a server. That could be a performance counter, uh, for example, uh, processor time, um, or some other performance counter. And then you want to find out about which queries are using all the resources. So then you go into Query Store and you look at the period um, where you had a high resource utilization, and then you find out about which queries were using most of the resources. Okay, once you identify the queries, then you can dive into the query plans. You can look at the runtime statistics. You can look at the weight statistics. Maybe there are some bad plans. Maybe there are some missing indexes. Maybe you need to do some plan forcing. And maybe you also want to find out about which are the applications. Maybe it's executing a query super frequently. And you want to find out about which are the applications, which are the users. And as I mentioned before, we don't have this information in Query Store. So then you will have to get data from DMX request and DMX sessions or extended events. And then you will need to correlate this data with data from Query Store. So this is like the common step. High resource utilization on the server, you go down, identify which queries are using the resources. You analyze what you can in Query Store, and you try to find additional information through DMV and extended events about the context, who was executing, which applications. So this is like one common way of using Query Store. That's where Query Store is very powerful. And then there's another way of using Query Store. And that is you're starting with an incident where a query or store procedure is timing out or maybe just running slow, but there's not very overall high resource utilization on the server. But the query or store procedure that is timing out or running slow might be very critical. So then the first thing you have to do is that you have to find the query ID in Query Store. That might not be, uh, you know, might not be so easy from the incident. Maybe it's not clear exactly which query it is. Maybe you have the application. Maybe you have the user from the, maybe you have the host name, but you might not have the exact query and you don't have the query ID. So what can you do then? 
then you will need to collect data from either DMX request and uh, DMX sessions or maybe extended events. And then you will have to try to correlate the data. So that means that you continuously would have to, co to collect data from the DMX request and DMX sessions, find it there, and then you can uh, go to query store to find a query ID. And then once you found the query ID, you can go into query store. And again, you can analyze the plans. You can analyze the runtime statistics, weight statistics, are there any bad plans, missing indexes, and so on. So you see two different ways of using query store. The first one, you start by high resource utilization on a server, and you do the analysis from there. The other one, you start with a query or store procedure that's timing out that might be very critical. And you want to find out, you know, what's the reason for that and how can you fix it? So in both of those cases, I mentioned that you might have, you might have to correlate data between query store and DMVs like DMX request and DMX accessions. So how can you do that? So there are two columns. So in query store, you have this column here called statement SQL handle, and you have another one called context settings ID. Those columns are also available in DMX requests. And DMX requests uh, has a link to DMX accessions on the session ID. And in DMX accessions, you have useful information like the host name, you have the application name, login name, and so on. So that means that if you can collect data from DMX requests and DMX accession continuously at some interval, then you can use this as a link to find query ID in query store. So let's see how you can do that. So I have made a demo here. So here we're saying that we have a critical report that was timing out. And in the incident, we have the application name. We have the host name. We know what time it happens. But we don't know, know exactly what query it was. And sometimes there might be a lot of queries that is similar. So how can you find out about that? What we do have is that we have collected data to our own monitoring system from DMX request and DMX accessions. So let's have a look at first how we do this data collection. So I just have a local SQL Server agent job here. So let's have a look at that. And we have a job here. That is uh, collecting the data from the DMVs and is storing it into a DBA database. So in a DBA database, I have one table called DBO DMX accessions, and I have another one, DMX requests. So I'm just looping around here, and I'm uh, writing uh, inserting data to those tables every ten seconds. You see, I have a pause here. Uh, every 10 seconds, waiting 10 seconds. So then let's um, start out here. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to execute the query. And this is a query in the incident. So this one is going to run for a while. And then after some time, we can abort it to simulate that this was a timeout. As Let's see now, now it's been running for almost 20 seconds. Let's. OK, let's abort it now. OK. So now the first thing we want to do is we want to find this query 
in the data that we have collected in our monitoring database. So let's have a look here. So here we have filters on uh, my login names, host name, and application name. And as you see, I'm joining together the DMX accession with DMX requests. Now let's see here. And we're only looking at the last one minute. So as you saw before, we're taking, you can say, snapshots of those DMVs every 10 seconds. So you see we have here 190641, 51, and so on. So what we want to do now is that we want to find those columns that I mentioned before. So let's see here in DMXEC requests. Here we have the statement SQL handle. And the other one here, statement context ID. So what we want to do now is that we want to take this information and try to find a query in query store. So next here, I am just joining together query store query with query store query texts. And I take the statement SQL handle and I take the statement context ID. Let's see, that was already, this, already the right one. And now you see here, here I found the query ID. So now once I have the query ID, then I can continue to look here. I can find uh, the plan, query ID 21. I have the plan here. And let's see, I can look at that like this. And then I can also look at the runtime statistics. So I'm just joining together here, runtime statistics with a query store plan. And again, filled on the same query ID. And now we can see here that um, we had this one aborted execution, uh, just, uh, Let's see. Yeah, it had to be this one here. Okay, so uh, one thing that all the, the dates in a query store is in UTC. That's the, that's the reason for the time difference uh, versus my local time here. So you see that in the beginning, we didn't even know what query it was. All we knew we knew what was the application, we knew the host name, and we knew the, we knew the login name. And with the monitoring data that we're collecting from DMX sessions and DMX request, we managed to find this uh, uh, statement SQL handle and the context settings ID. And then based on that, we found the query ID, and then we can use that for further analysis in query store. So you see, it's very powerful to collect this data from DMX accession to DMX request all the time. And that could be local monitoring as I was doing now. It could be some central monitoring system that you build. It could be um, some vendor monitoring system. There can be different ways of doing it. So one other scenario here that's, in, that's important to be aware of is that sometimes you might have different applications executing the same query or same store procedure. Uh, that could be, for example, you have the, your production uh, application, maybe a .NET application that is executing something. And then the DBAs or developers is also trying it with Management Studio. And then you will find that it might have different query IDs, not only one query ID, but different query ID for the same query. And the reason for that then is that um, your .NET application 
and a management studio, they will have different set options. And because of that, there will be different context settings ID, and then there will be different query IDs. And uh, then it's of course important to, uh, to take the right one when you're analyzing the data. And that is easier if you have the data from uh, DMX accessions, DMX requests, then it's easier to pick the right one to analyze and maybe or even force a plan or, uh, or something. Now let's have a look at some different common issue with queries and plan forcing in query store. So there are a few things can, that can happen that prevent plan forcing from working. So one thing is that if you have a store procedure um, and you drop and recreate it, and as we for, saw before, the object ID is part of the composite key. That means that if you drop and recreate the store procedure, you will get a new query ID. Another thing that can happen is that developer is doing some small modifications to a statement. That could just be some formatting or maybe a new column to the select. What happens then? Well, then you'll get a new statement SQL handle. Remember the statement SQL handle is a hash of the, of the statement. And because of that, you will get a new uh, query ID, a new query text ID and a new query ID. So why does that matter? Why does it matter if you get a new query ID? Well, there are a few different things to consider here. One thing is, of course, that if you're analyzing, uh, you know, historical uh, data for this query, well, if you got a new query ID, then you will have no history. It means that you will have to look at multiple query IDs if you want to get a picture of the, of the performance of this, uh, this query. Another thing is that, let's say that you had a forced plan. Let's say that you have a performance problem in the past and you forced the plan. Well, if you got a new query ID, then the new query ID does not have a forced plan. That means that you can get back the same performance problem again. Another thing is, of course, that if you want to force a plan, you don't have a history on the new query ID so that you will not be able to force like a last good uh, known plan. So there are multiple things to consider when you are getting new query IDs. And it also means that you should be careful, try not to drop and recreate store procedures, for example. It's better to alter instead to keep the same object ID and there with the same query ID. Now we're going to look at different tools that you can use to analyze the query store data. We're going to look at the management studio, built-in reports. We're going to look at how you can use script to analyze the data. And we're going to look at Power BI and Excel Power Pivot. So let's start by uh, the management studio reports. So we have a database here and we're looking at a two weeks period. And then we can see here, okay, this is the, let's see here, this is top resource consuming queries. And then you can see here, there's one query here, query 57, that's the one being uh, using the most resources. And you can change if you want to look at duration, if you want to look at the CPU or what you want to look at. Now let's see how you can do the same thing using a script. So I prepared a script here that's looking at the same data. It's a bit difficult to see here, but I'm joining together the query store runtime statistics. Let's see here, <clears throat> I created a CT. I'm joining together the query store runtime statistics with a query store plan. Query store queries, query store text. And you see I'm summing here, summing the executions, duration, CPU time, and so on. 
and I'm looking at a specific interval. Same interval as I'm looking at in this report here. So let's execute this one. And then you can see here again, query 57, same query that we have here. So why did I make a script? Well, you can see that by having a script, you have a little bit more flexibility. You can do filtering as you like, you can add additional columns, you can do some more things. And it's quite useful to have like a base script like this and then tweak it as you need for different investigations. Now we're going to look at how we can use Power BI to analyze the data from Query Store. So again, it's the same data that we're looking at, two weeks period, data from Query Store. And now I import the tables in uh, Power BI. So you can see here we have the tables, the catalog views from, uh, from Query Store. You see Query Store plan, Query Store query, and so on. Here we have the visualizations. So this page here is two visualizations. The top one is showing the top queries in um, most resource consuming queries in um, Query Store. So this is basically the same thing as the report that we were looking at before in Management Studio, and also the same as the TSQL script, basically the same thing. The lower one is the overall resource consumptions in the database, all queries together. So we see that there seem to be some spikes here, Seems like in the midnight, there, has, there seems to be some spikes. So now let's see how you can, how these two visualizations are working together. So let's say that you want to see, okay, this query 57, how much of the total resource utilization is that? Then you can highlight this one. And then you can see here that this query is actually, that is a darker blue. Then you can see that is actually a very big part of the overall load, overall resource consumption on the server. So you see the light blue, that is the total resource consumption. And the little bit darker blue is this query 57, right? So you see that you can, use the two visualizations together like this. Or you can do it the other way around. What if you want to see this specific uh, one hour interval here? What is using the most resources then? So then I can just select here one of these. And then I get the top, top uh, resource consuming queries for just this one hour interval. And you see it's still query 57, but there are some que other queries that's also using a lot of resources here. Now, what if you want to see some more details about the queries? What is this query 57? Then I made it so you can just hover over like this, and then you see the query, and also some other, some other information. Let's go back here to the starting point. Now we're looking at the overall period again. Now maybe you want to see, hmm, this query 57, why is that using so much resources? How, how many times is it executed? How, how long time does each execution take and so on? Then you see here that we have another page here, query history. And I can then just do like this. Let's see, I right click on one query and then I do drill through query history. And then I get to the query ID 57, just in the other visualization. So now I can see here, 
I can see here you see that the intervals in query store and I can see hour by hour how many executions, uh, were there any bottle executions, what was the average duration, hour by hour, average CPU, hour by hour, and some more information here about the logical reads, logical writes, physical reads, temp to be, what was the row count, and so on. So these are just examples what you can do, but you see it's very powerful here to analyze things in, uh, in Power BI. So now let's take a closer look at how do you do this? So in one of the slides here, I made a list of the steps that you need to do. Okay, the first thing is you need to have Power BI Desktop. And that is just a free tool that you can download. And then the next thing is that you need to go in and in Power BI Desktop, and you need to import the data. So let's see how that works. So here in Power BI, you have, you can see three sections. You have the report. Here you have the data. And there's also like, uh, you can see a diagram view where you can see each of the, each of the tables in Power BI. So what I've been doing here is that for each of the tables, I've been going in here, get data, and then I just select SQL Server. And what happens then is that you just specify which is the server, which is the database. And here we put in the SQL statement. So that would just be a select against, uh, for example, query store, query text. So let's look at one of the existing one, how it looks like. So if we take this again, query store, query text, I can see here, edit query. Then you click here. And now you see here, you see this is the local uh, SQL Server instance. Here is the database. And here you can see the query. So for each of the queries in query stores, for each of the, you can say, each of the catalog views in query store that you're going to use, you need to import it like this. Um, after importing it, you will get the relations automatically, but you will have to go in and add uh, primary keys uh, yourself. So um, let's see here, here specify the key column, query text ID in this example. So let's see what more steps you need to do. So one tip here is that when you import the data, it's easier if you import it as totals. So you take the average values times the, the count of the executions. Um, you define the key columns, as I mentioned. Uh, the relationships, you will, um, that will be uh, created for you automatically, but you can go in and have a look at them. For example, here we have a relationship between a query text and query store query. So I can go in and have a look at the properties here. And then we can see here that, okay, here we have the query store query, here we have the query store text, and we are joining on, or we have, you can say the relationships are on the query store text here and query store text here. So what else do we have? Uh, you can create something called measures. If you want to have average values, you would need to create measures. And then you go ahead and create your visualizations. 
and there are a lot of different uh, visualization types. I just show a few of them here, but a lot of other ones. And then finally, you, have, you can publish it to, uh, to Power BI in Azure. You don't have to do that. You can also just analyze it in Power BI desktop on your computer, but you can also publish it to, um, to Power BI in Azure. Now we're gonna look at how we can use Excel Power Pivot to analyze the data in Query Store. So here we have an Excel sheet where we can see for each query, we can see the duration day by day. So you see the total duration here, and we can see it day by day. Now let's say that we wanted to look at something else. For example, uh, let's say the CPU. How can you do that? So very easy. Just go in here, show field list, and then we um, search for the CPU. Total CPU. And then we just add this one. And then we can remove the duration. And I just need to go in and sort it again. So now we can see for each query, we can see day by day, uh, what is the total CPU utilization or C total CPU consumption. So you see very powerful when analyzed uh, the data in your, uh, in your database. You can also look at the bottle queries. So here we have again for each query, day by day, the bottle queries. And you can look at the exceptions. So uh, exceptions are some kind of error that happened. Here we only had exception for one query, but uh, yeah, sometimes you can have exceptions for different queries. And we can also look at the weight statistics. So here you can see the weight statistics from Query Store. You can see the different weight categories and you can see it day by day. So how much, how many, how much weight, how many seconds are we waiting for the different weight categories day by day? And we can also drill down here and look at the different queries. So let's say that we're interested in, for example, let's say that the buffer latches, maybe we're wondering, Hmm, which queries are having the most buffer latches? Okay, then you can drill in like this. And uh, let me just sort it here also. So you see, this is very powerful to get an overview of the weights in, uh, in your database. Where do you have the different types of weights? Now let's look at how do you do this? How can you create an Excel sheet like this? So you just need to go into the Power Pivot. So you go here, Data, and Manage Data Model. And this data model, it's like a database inside Excel. You can say that is this uh, Power Pivot. So here you can see the different uh, catalog views from, um, from uh, Query Store. So we have here, Crystal plan, crystal query, crystal text, and so on. And then you can also uh, look at, uh, let's see, we can look at uh, relationships. So here we can see the relationships between the tables. So how you do this is that you go in here, and then for each of the catalog views in, um, in Query Store that you want to analyze the data from, you go here, import data from SQL Server, and then you specify the server name, the database name, and then the next step, uh, you put in a query, and then you import the data. And when you've been doing that for, uh, for all the catalog views, then you go in and define the relationships. So 
So I made a step-by-step -step, uh, slide here. So this one we've been looking at and we have imported the data. And again, uh, it's easier if you import totals, uh, not the average values. Average values you can calculate later, but it's easier if you import totals. So that's how I've been doing. You define the relationships, and then you can create uh, different measures, for example, average values. And once you've been doing that, you go in and create your pivot tables. So the pivot tables, those are the one we're looking at here. So just like with Power BI, Power Pivot is very powerful for analyzing data in, uh, in Queer Store. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at this email address, eula at hallingren.com. And a special thanks to Microsoft for supporting this conference. And thank you all for attending these sessions. Thank you.